Good morning, and welcome to Tusculum Church Online. We're glad you are joining us. I uh, want to remind everybody that uh, a lot of our activities are taking place online. Our Bible studies, discussion groups, children's activities, youth activities, all of that stuff is still taking place online. So please contact the person that is typically in charge of that and find out how you can get involved. And if you're not involved in something that is taking place online, check with somebody else and see if you can be involved in the things that they are doing. Uh, did want to mention that we are aware that we have had some issues with our sound being synced up with our uh, mouths. Uh, so we are trying to fix that. We are making some adjustments, and uh, we will keep trying until we get everything straightened out. So thank you for being patient with us as we try to do that. Our call to worship this morning is from Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 48. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Before we show the video for our children's message, I would like to remind not just our children, but everybody, that we are all works in progress. We are all under construction. As you are well aware, many tools can be used for multiple purposes. We can use tools to tear things down, and we can use tools to build things up. And my hope is that this will be a reminder to use the tools we've been given to build people up. Most important of all. 
How so? Protection, man. With all the hammering and prying and measuring, pieces of crystal are bound to fly everywhere. This keeps me safe. You think so? Well, sure. Well, I better get back to it. You know, Derek, I think you're using the wrong tools. This is the tool you need to build Christians. A Bible? <laughs> but that's only words. You won't find any hammers in there. But there are words that strike like hammers at people's hearts. Really? Hmm. Well, uh, how about crowbar? There are words in here that can pry people out of their seats and into action. And the whole Bible is a ruler. It's like God's measuring stick. I see. Here's where they get thrown out if they don't measure up, eh? No, Dirk. Here's where a Christian asks God's forgiveness and starts to build again. Huh. Start again? But... But I, I bet nothing in there can replace my old hard hat. You see, protection's the ticket. There's prayer. Prayer, you say? So talking to God protects me? Hmm. Could I borrow your Bible for a while? Sure. In fact, why don't you keep it? I have others. Yeah? Well, thanks, buddy. Here. I don't think I'll need it now. Cameras, crowbars, rulers, yeah. So long, buddy.
is all we need. And lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Sing to the King. Sing to the King. Speak 
to me, Lord, speak to me. Speak to me. Speak to me. Through your word, through your spirit, speak your words of life. Speak to me. Speak to me. I am listening. I am waiting. Speak. Welcome to Tusculum Cumberland Presbyterian Church. We're glad to have you worshiping with us online this morning. And uh, we just want to say welcome. Brian was asking me this morning how my week went, and it uh, I was really busy. It kind of flew by. It was very fast, uh, much like the, uh, the turtle that was robbed by two snails. Uh, the police came to interview him, and they asked the turtle, can you explain to us what happened? And he said, oh, I don't know. Um, it all happened so fast. Anyway, um, I hope that uh, you've enjoyed worship up to this point. I hope that you have taken time to pray for this worship service and all the elements of it. And um, we invite you to join us uh, in our prayer of the church. And I'll read the first part and I would ask you to respond in the second part. Would you join me? Father, we testify today to your greatness, love, and compassion. We acknowledge our sin and beg for your forgiveness. We claim the promises of Scripture. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We accept your forgiveness. We accept your grace and the promise of heaven that awaits us when we die. We accept your mercy and our salvation from hell and the punishment we deserve. We accept your love and promise to share it with others. Amen. At this time, my daughter, Sila, is going to read scripture for me today. Esther 7, 7 through 10. The king arose in his anger from drinking wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg his life from the queen Esther, from who he saw that harm had been determined against him by the king. Now when the king returned from the palace garden into the place where they were drinking wine, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. 
Then the king said, Will he even assault the queen with me in the house? As word went out with the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Herabona, one of the eunuchs who were before the king, said, Behold, indeed, the gallows standing in Haman's house fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king. And the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. We were reading from the book of Esther, and uh, what a tremendous book uh, would be a great devotional for you to be able to do, um, to take different parts of it, different chapters of it, and read it uh, during a week or over the course of a month. And um, it is it's tremendous in terms of what it talks about. Today, uh, the title of the sermon is Who You're Going to Call, kind of the old Ghostbusters uh, logo motto from that. And we're trying to get from just listening to obeying. We're trying to move, remember we've talked about for the last several weeks, and last week we spent a whole lot of time talking about seeing Jesus in the Old Testament, all the prophecies and all the times that he appeared and all the scriptures about him that lead up to the New Testament to prove all that went on in his life and his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension into heaven. And we're trying to figure out at this point how we can get to the point where we listen to Jesus and do what he says. You know, when we get to the... Um, the Lord's Prayer. You know, the, the disciples asked Jesus, how should we pray? One of the things is, that he mentions to them in this prayer is he says, thy will be done on earth. Now, one of the things that's frustrating to us as parents, teachers, ministers, whatever it might be, is that people can be polite and listen to us what we have to say, whether we're giving them advice, whether we're teaching them how to do something, teaching them math, whatever it might be, they might be polite and listen to us, and then they go and do the complete opposite. I know as a coach, coaching my own children, I would say, hey, this is what you need to do when you get up there, get ready to hit, or when you're on the mound, getting ready to pitch, or a ball is hit to you, do this. And then they would go out in the game, and they wouldn't do those things. And I'd be like, why? They were listening. They heard what I said but they didn't put it into practice. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, and it, it is important for us about, you know, to, to kind of um, think about who are we willing to listen to and obey? For many of us, if I was preaching and I got up here and I put on, you know, if I said, hey, we're going to have church and I'm going to put this stuff on, this would be how I came into church and I had this on and this hat, a lot of people would be like, click They'd turn it off. They'd be like, I am not listening to any of that junk. He had on UT stuff. If he, if he plays Rocky Top, I'd swear I'm going to throw something, right? Many of us, depending on, you know, this week was the NFL draft, and I'm a Dolphins fan. And, you know, I have children. My son is a Patriots fan, and my other son is a Bills fan. And in our house during the NFL season, we don't get along. And sometimes if I'm wearing this, they're like, I don't want to talk to you, dude. You're, you're a long-suffering Dolphins fan. Who wants to hear that, right? Or it may be that um, you're a, in baseball, a Braves fan. You know, Tyler is a huge St. Louis Cardinals fan, and if I walk around with this Braves shirt, he might say, oh, man, not another Braves fan, not another homer from the South that the, you know, TBS baseball, uh, you know, person that follows a fan. The, what if I came in and I had on this hat backwards. Some of y'all would be like, what is that guy doing? He looks like an idiot. He's got gray hair. He's got his hair on, uh, hat on backwards. Why would I listen to him? What if I turned it this way? Do you realize that you have children, college students, even young adults who have friends who wear their hat this way and they listen to what they say and they obey what they say? To us, a lot of us would be like, no way. If, I, if you came in and I had this hat on, would you be willing to listen to me give you advice? Some of us would go, there is no way that I'm taking financial advice from this guy. There was a friend of mine who was, uh, he worked at a convenience store and he got fired. And the next job that he got was doing financial planning for a company. And he called me and he said, hey, I want to come look at all your financials and, and see how I can help you plan your future finances. And I went, no, no, absolutely not. You just got fired from a convenience store. Why would I do that? For us, who are we willing to listen to? And, you know, what if, uh, 
What if I had a, this bandana on my head? Or if I had a turban on my head? Or if I was a woman? Or what if uh, I had long hair? A lot of us, especially if we're from up north, would you want to take advice from somebody that was going, hey, come here for a minute, I want to tell you something. I'm going to give you, something. I'm going to give you a piece of advice. Right? We, we tend to, when people have a real southern accent, we tend to go, they have a really low IQ. And that's not true at all, but we don't listen to them and obey what they have to say sometimes. So other times, we're not willing to listen to somebody, and these are kind of a style thing. What I mean by that is, a lot of parents wonder why their kids don't listen, and when they talk to their kids, they're yelling and screaming. They're, they're irate. They're going, well, I want you to do this, and they're screaming and yelling, and the kids are like, I'm not listening to that. I'm not hearing that. I'm not going to obey that. Or maybe it's, you know, when I was in college, I had a professor of economics who would come in and he would walk in the door. He would say, class is starting. And then he would walk back and forth without ever looking at the class for an hour and 15 minutes and talk about economics. In a very monotone voice, he would say, you know, the thing about economics that's really good is that you really have to be able, and people were like, Oh my goodness, there's absolutely no way that I can sit and listen to this guy forever. How am I going to make a good grade in this class? How am I going to listen and obey to somebody that talks like that? Sometimes we, especially in the church, are guilty of using big words in the way that we talk to people. We as pastors get up and we say things that have the words eschatology and resurrection and sanctification and, and sacrificial and, and Armageddon and all these giant words and people are like, they do that dog thing. You know when your dog hears something that he doesn't understand, the dog always goes, kind of does that number. That's, that's the way it is when we're trying to make ourselves look good by using giant words. It, it limits the communication, and nobody's going to listen and obey that. So for us, you know, I, I kind of looked at it, and I was thinking, especially as a man, what, how do I know when I would be um, willing to obey for sure, that I would listen and obey for sure? And I kind of narrowed it down to our five senses of, like, seeing something. If I'm, you know, we used to go to a, a restaurant called Gondolier in Knoxville. And when we would walk into Gondolier, the first thing they had was this cabinet on this side. It was a glass case. It was a cooler. And the glass case had nothing in it but cakes. Beautiful, fancy, big, tall cakes. And I would walk in and I would be like, and my kids would be like licking that glass. I mean, they're like, dad, 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 get us some cake, get us some cake. And when you saw it, you went, yeah, I'm going to have a piece of that cake. Because we saw it. It looked good to us. Well, when we're looking at these five senses, selfishly is what's driving this in us. It's this selfishness of, I want the cake, I'm going to get it. Um, the, uh, you know, my wife and I, this is such a terrible story. This is so bad. We went on a cruise, and we went to an, uh, they took us on an excursion to an island, and they said, oh, there's all this wonderful stuff here. There's volleyball, and there's, you know, there's uh, the water sports and all this kind of stuff, and they were laying out, and there's food and, and all this, and they said, okay, but be aware, if you go past that point right there of the, where the beach and the, this point is, then that's the nude beach that's there. And just be aware, you have to be 18 years old to go around to the nude beach. So Jill and I are laying out in the sun and everything, and I'm sitting there and I said, you know, Jill, I'm, I'm going to get up and take a walk. And so I'm walking in the sand and the ocean's just as beautiful as it can be, and I'm walking towards that point, and I said, you know, I am full-grown man. I have never been to a nude beach. I wonder what a nude beach is like. And I said, I, you know, there might be naked women there. Carrie Underwood might be visiting this island, and she would come running down the beach, and I would see that firsthand. And I walked down there to that point, and I went around the corner, and this giant African man came running down the beach at me completely naked, and I went, that's enough. Okay, I got to go. I got to go this way. I got to go, right? What we see oftentimes immediately, hey, this is you know, clicks into place for us and causes us to obey something that might not be in our best interest. How about the sense of smell? The sense of smell can make us obey. Do you believe me or not? Uh, how about when you go to the movie theater? I will walk into a movie theater, and I'm, I miss the movie theater right now, especially during quarantine. But when you walk into a movie theater, I will say to myself, Chris, you're a, you're a fat man. You don't need any popcorn. Don't get popcorn. It's expensive. It's overpriced. Don't get popcorn. As soon as I walk into the movie theater and they're popping popcorn and I smell it, I go, 
I think we need the bucket, the one that's about this big with the free refills, right? The smell sometimes will put us in homemade bread that's cooking. If you've, Jill and Sila made homemade bread this week, and they said, do you want a piece? Of course I want a piece. It smells like heaven. It's unbelievable. Um, taste can make us obey, can make us listen. You know, if somebody's making cookies, um, when you sit down in a, oh man, Brian, I miss Mexican restaurants. Miss Mexican restaurants because chips and salsa. I will sit and eat like 15 baskets of chips and salsa, and they go, do you want another Diet Coke? I'm like, yeah, I want another Diet Coke to go with my 15 bags, baskets of chips. I, but it's kind of like, oh my goodness, this is so good, this is so good. And it, whatever our body wants in that sense, that selfishly within us, that meet that need, it feels good, it smells good, it looks good, I want it, and it comes to fruition into our lives. How about hearing? You know, sometimes as a coach, a minister, or teachers, you'll see other parents that'll come up and they'll go, coach, you are the smartest man. Did you played ball somewhere, didn't you? You've got so much skill. I can tell, hey, you know, coach, you are such a great man. And all they're looking for is playing time for their kids. They come up to somebody, people will butter us up and we hear those words and we're like, you know, they're right. They're, they're right. I, I am pretty great. And those things can get us to do something like play their kids more or give a kid a look. You know, how many times have you gone to a teacher trying to butter her up and you go, I've got an 80, 89.4. And if I had a 90, I would make an A. And the teacher goes, well, you know, you're the greatest teacher ever. And you've, I've learned so much under your tutelage. Your wisdom and knowledge is unfathomable. And they go, okay, I'll give you an A. That hearing, sometimes that, that buttering us up, those things, you know, cause us to obey. The last one, of course, touch. Women are notorious for this. Come up to a man and go, have you been working out? Wow. You know, and you go, and of course, as men, we go, yeah, I opened a jar of grape jelly this morning at my house. No one else could open. You know, we, we're, we're so stuck on ourselves sometimes that a little compliment like that goes a long way in terms of getting us to obey or do what somebody wants. You know, touch also, I would say, the feel of money makes us obedient a lot of times to doing things that we probably shouldn't do. So for us, we need to, as the, uh, you know, why, why is this important, what I'm talking about? Because I'm not trying to drone on about this. It's important because we need to, what happens when we get in life and things happen? Who are we going to call for advice or who are we going to call in an emergency situation? Is this the guy that you want your kids calling when they're having an emergency? Or when they need advice on something that's extremely important? Probably not. And so the church, we've kind of, we've kind of messed up here. Let me, let me explain what I'm talking about here. Okay, look at this with me. Who are you going to call? This week I put together a bicycle for my son. We got Noah a mountain bike for his birthday, and uh, I decided I would put it together. And so I got out the 57-page assembly guide. 57 pages, lots of diagrams and writing. It's in three different languages, but there's that. Oh, no, wait. They also gave me addendum number one that is front and back right here. This piece of, of good stuff here. And then addendum two here, the front and back. Addendum three, front and back. Addendum four, front and back. And addendum five, front and back. When I was sitting in school and my teachers were explaining to me how to read things and how to do math and how to do science and how to spatially put things together in my head, I was going, I see one Square on the ceiling, two squares, three squares. Not paying attention, not listening, or putting into practice what they were trying to teach me for a test or a quiz or a paper or project. And so when you get here and you get to this point and they're handing you all this stuff, can you put the bicycle together? Well, I know you go, but Chris, that's such a small thing. I can pay somebody to put that together. But hang on. How about reading a bank statement? How about applying for a credit card? How about buying... Um, a, uh, buying your groceries or furniture or clothes? How about buying a car or buying a house or a legal or employment agreement or filing your taxes? Jill filed unemployment for my youngest son, helped him to do that, and it took all day, basically, to fill out all the forms that went along with that. Were we prepared for that moment because we listened and obeyed what a teacher told us throughout our training and upbringing. 
that's where we are in terms of the stuff that's going on in our lives. But even more importantly, what about in the more important things like who are you going to call? Who are you going to ask for advice? Who are you going to listen to and obey about your marriage? Who are you going to listen to about parenting and alcohol or drug addiction or health issues? You know, I've got a friend. I came in one Sunday, and I was, I was kind of sick, and, and I said, uh, this is years ago. And I, this guy said, are you, are you okay? And I said, no, I don't feel very well. And he goes, tell you what, if you'll just drink a shot glass full of hydrogen peroxide every day, you'll never be sick. And I went, a shot glass full of hydrogen peroxide. My grandfather, when he would get a cut of any kind, he would go, put some kerosene on that, rub some kerosene on that. And I'd be like, kerosene? Rub kerosene on it? I mean, you know, I, I sh probably shouldn't argue with that because he lived to be 90 years old. But, you know, he, the things that people tell us and advice that they give us, those are really important things in our lives. Those are the things that are that, that me so meaningful to us and are so things that we need to get right, things that we need to make sure that we can do those things. And so the, the church is supposed to be helping us to do both of those things. It's supposed to be helping us train our kids and youth and adults, college students, all of them, everybody, no matter what age you are, so that we can do those things that we just talked about, like be able to put a bike together, file our taxes, or that we can fix our marriages, our parenting issues, whatever it might be, but we have to get straight who we're listening to and that we obey, that we put it into practice, whatever they're teaching us. That is why coaches do practice. You know, Wes was talking about before the service about, about playing football at Bethel, and, you know, just the idea of football practices are a real pain. They're not fun, but the reason you do them is because when you get in the game, somebody's going to hit you in the mouth. Somebody is going to try to run you over or tackle you, and you got to know what to do in those moments. So in practice, we're learning to listen to what the proper technique is, what the play is, how to do it, and then in the games to put it into practice. And so here we stand, and, and this has been, this is kind of where we are as a church, and Wes actually, is, I think, going to put this one up on the screen. It is from 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. This is Paul writing... And this is kind of the state of the church in America, especially. It says, I'm going to start in verse 2, where it says, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Do you know that the History Channel, this has been over 10 years ago, ran a special series where for, for five weeks they did this. They did a special on Bigfoot. They did a special on the Loch Ness Monster. They did a special on Chupacabra. They did a special on aliens. And the fifth one was Jesus. What was the point they were trying to make? For us, we need to figure out who we listen to and obey and put into practice. So when you look at this, the, the, the particular scripture that Selah read for us was from uh, Esther, and it was in chapter 7, and it is the, and I started at the end. I started with the big finale of Esther, which is Haman gets hung on a gallows. Now, the NIV, which Wes put up, said that he was impaled on a post. That's one interpretation. That's the NIV's interpretation. Um, the King James and the New American Standards say, hey, he built a, a gallows that was 75 feet high, and King Xerxes hung Haman on his own gallows, on that gallows that he had intended for Mordecai. And so when we sit here, we started at the end. Let's, let's look at what went on here just real quick. In chapter 5, Haman uh, is mad because Mordecai won't bow down to him. Mordecai is a Jew. Haman is second in command to King Xerxes um, in Babylon. And so here he is, and um, he is, it says, Haman, I'm going I'm to read from verse 9. Haman went out, this is chapter 5, verse 9. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits, but when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, 
Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him, and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow, but all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. And here's the part you need to hear for more. His wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Have a pole set up reaching to a height of 50 cubits, 75 feet high. And ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the pole set up or built. The gallows outside of his house, he had this erected there and put there with the intent of putting Mordecai on it. Who did he listen to? And how did he obey? His wife and his friends were like, man, you're awesome. You're second in command of the whole place. You got power, prestige, honor. Why on earth are you worried about this fly, this guy that's sitting down there at the gate disrespecting you? He's a nobody. Why don't you just build a gallows and hang that little fly on there because he's meaningless and you're somebody. And he heard all that and he just kind of took it to heart, listened to it, mulled it over for 30 seconds and went, yes, that's exactly what we ought to do. And he had it built. In the story of Esther from beginning to end, it is a story of either people listening to somebody that's giving them good advice or somebody listening to somebody that's giving them poor advice. And in our lives, every single day, we have kids and grandkids, we have aunts, uncles, brothers and sisters, parents, whatever, and we watch them and we watch this process go on in their lives every single day. Somebody's giving them good information and blessing comes into their lives. They put it into practice. Someone's coaching them, training them, teaching them good things, and it blesses their lives. And then we labor, and we sit there, and we go, golly, we watch our family members. We watch people, and sometimes it's us. We listen to people who don't have our best interests at heart. I sat in an elder of, of one of the churches that I was at. I sat in his, in his living room, and I was asking about a lady, and I said, I hadn't seen her in a while, and um, she was a widow. Her husband had passed away. And I said, I hadn't seen her in a while. just wondered where she was. And he said, ah, you know, I, I don't know. He goes, I don't think she's, she, she's struggling right now. She's making some poor decisions. And his wife, this elder's wife was in the kitchen and she came out and she goes, she's not making poor decisions. She's had a lot of heartache and pain. She's suffered a lot. She's living with a man right now and she's having all the best sex of her life. They're going out dancing and drinking every night. She's having a good time and she deserves it because of all that she suffered through. And I sat there and I looked at the elder, the guy, and I said, this is not going to help her at all. This is not going to fix what ails her long term. It might make her feel good for a short period of time, but it comes at a greater price. A lot of pain and suffering in the midst of that. When we go back, you know, you're sitting there and you're, you're trying to, to figure out, hey, Chris, I need for you to give me something I can use. Give me some action steps to help me here to be able to explain either to, for my own use or for my kids or for my teenagers. I always try to think of college students because I have three of them right now in that age group uh, about, you know, what is it that could get us to where we listen and obey people who are giving us good, godly Christian advice. And uh, for us, you know, if you got little kids, and you, or you have teenagers, you know, I, I think of like Michelle Knowles, got, she's here, she was here singing a couple weeks back, and she's got kids that are in that, that age group or whatever, is that I would comfort some of those people by saying, our brains, our kids' brains are still developing until they're 25 years old. That is what experts, not only psychiatrists, but regular doctors tell us, brain, the brain is still developing until they're 25. So I'm going to explain that to you in simple terms. Your kids are brain damaged until they're 25. Mine too, all right? So, so we, we understand each other. We've got to understand uh, um, that for us, um, we got to try to identify with where they are. We got to try to remember where they are. You know that walk a mile in their moccasins kind of thing. Think about Jesus in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. There's a woman that's caught in the act of adultery. She's brought in, thrown down at Jesus' feet. And they're like, this woman was caught in adultery. It says we're supposed to stone her. What do you say, Jesus? And Jesus says, well, you know, the one of you that's without sin, pick up the first stone and toss it at her. And they all kind of go off one by one. Nobody, nobody stones her and nobody condemns her. And, and he reaches down and helps her up. 
And as she's standing up, he says, there's no one here to condemn you. And he says, but go and sin no more. He's trying in that moment to say, hey, all this stuff you've been doing, turn from that. And the word would be repent. Turn 180 degrees from that and follow me because the advice that I'm going to give you, the, the things, the principles, the training, all of the things that I have in the, in the word of God, if you put those into practice, then you find life and life to the full here on earth. You find eternal life. You find blessings on relationships and uh, on your finances and all of those wonderful things that come about. The third one that, that is there. So the first two is just kind of, the first one was a playing one. You know the first one is always pray and fast. Those are the first action steps that I always give you for any situation that's going on in your life. But prayer, how, how, every morning I get up and I pray for my kids and my wife. I pray for this church. But specifically for my kids, I pray for things like protection. I'm sending my kids out into the world in, onto interstates to college campuses, to businesses, wherever it might be. And there's the opportunity for them to get injured, to get hurt, to get ill, whatever it might be, to have somebody become a negative influence in their lives. I pray for the, you know, to God. I say, give them great godly Christian friends and boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever it is. I, I say, Lord, watch out over them, bless them, uh, bless them in school, give them true love. I, I pray all those things for my kids every single day because the potential is there for them to get led astray. Because it says the path to hell is wide. And those going to heaven, it's a narrow path. And the Bible says few find it. And so I want all four of my kids practicing their faith, their Christian faith, and walking with God every single day and producing fruit. Number four, we've got to learn to communicate. And, and, I, and I'm, I may have to stop here. We're going to run out of time. But in Ephesians, uh, Paul writing to the church in Ephesus there are two passages. One is in chapter 4, verse 29. And near the end of the book is only like six chapters. But Paul's writing and he says, and see if you can take this to heart as a parent, as a friend, as a spouse. Because I can't. I struggle with this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. That's what you want. You want it to benefit your kids or your college students or your spouse or whoever it might be. That's what you really want. And so for us, we've got to be able to say, hey, I need to be more of an encourager. I need to be able to state this in a way that it builds them up rather than, you know, looking at somebody and, and calling them names or belittling them in some way. And look at this, because it continues in chapter 6 when he's kind of given some uh, instructions about our homes. He says, children, obey your parents. This is chapter 6, verse 1 of Ephesians. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Remember we talked about the sock example a couple of weeks back about, you know, getting to that frustration level in your household to where you're always just yelling at your kids and that I have experienced that. I've lived through that to where it's just easier to yell and have it get done immediately than to go through this song and dance back and forth. But in reality, the Bible is saying that's not helpful. You know, James uh, 1, uh, chapter, uh, verses 19 and 20, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry because it doesn't produce the life, the righteousness that you're looking for. That's a, that's a little bit of a sum, summarization there, but he's really pointing out to us, we need to be listening to our kids. We need to be not exasperating them, yelling. We've got to work on how we're communicating to people um, at work. Um, this, this all goes for, I mean, this is coworkers, bosses, all, we have those same issues um, at work, in our marriages, in our, with our kids, all in our neighborhoods even. The, uh, the next one that I have there is get involved in their lives. What I mean by that is I have friends who, uh, the Williams family, and uh, the dad and mom do science project videos with their kids uh, once a week. 
they will have fun making a video and they're funny, they laugh, they giggle, they do these science experiments and their kids are hanging on every word that comes out of those parents' mouths. They're teaching and training them about science and I think the same thing could be true of English and math and our, and our walk with Christ, the Bible and all, our faith, all of those things. Uh, we just need to get involved in their lives and make it more fun. Nobody wants to, everybody has sat, okay, Anybody sat in a church service, you're sitting here going, this is one of them, uh, where somebody's just kind of monotone, you know, reading to you where they're going, and then Jesus went over here and he did this, and, and you're going, when will this be over? Or you've been in those church services where uh, as a kid I'd go to my grandmother's and spend a week in the summertime and her pastor was a, was a really conservative Baptist pastor and he would walk on top of the pews and scream at you the entire time he preached. I heard no words that he said because I was so afraid that he was going to smack me or drag me off somewhere that I, I didn't hear any of it. And so for us as parents, we need to learn from that in terms of, and, and as employees, as spouses, hey, how can I uh, make this, uh, this whole process of educating my kid or uh, educating myself or whatever, how can I put all of this together so that it's more effective and more efficient and it doesn't give me a heart attack? The... Um, the last one that I would put there is, is an addendum to that, and that is get your kids involved in extracurricular activities. The more activities they're doing, the less time they have to get in trouble. And let me say this. Let me put a little spin on it. Get them involved in Christian activities. There's so many things out there that are wonderful, like Young Life and Yoke and Teens for Christ and FCA and Navigators, Campus Crusade. There's retreats. I, I know that, that Tyler does camps and retreats and mission trips and all these wonderful things. Get your kids involved in those things because they learn to, as I mentioned, uh, hearing Steve Chesney share the gospel for years uh, with Young Life is that he just kind of softly and quietly kind of reminded me sometimes of, of Andy Griffith kind of guy. I would just stand there and share the gospel um, and tell us about Jesus and, and what we could do in our lives and what we should do in our lives. And we soaked it up and listened to it and put it into practice. So for us, we need to learn that as, as parents. So the question is, why is all this important? Why the action steps? Why should we put them into place? Uh, why should we implement those kind of things into our lives? Why should we try to make a difference and get people to listen, whether it's our kids or employers or spouses, whatever it might be? Why as the church is it important for us to do this? Well, especially there's a, in 20 years time, we're going to be doing a lot of funerals in the church. We need the next generation to be leaders and to be the people that are carrying the church into the future. And so we have to be training up kids, youth, college kids, adults, all of those folks so that they can carry the torch through this time. For me, when I sit here, I look at, um, you know, the church is so vitally important in this particular part. I had a elder that uh, came to me. We, we used to go on mission trips uh, at the churches that I was at in, in Knoxville. And uh, this elder came to me and he said, my daughter's going on the mission trip. He's also a youth leader uh, in our youth group he was. And uh, he said, my daughter's boyfriend would like to go on the mission trip with us. Would that be okay with you? And I said, well, if you're okay with it, then I'm okay with it. I mean, you would know him. And he said, well, hang on. Uh, he is a drug user and he's a low level drug dealer. Um, so you need to take that into account. And I went, well, uh, let me talk to the elders. So I went to the elders and I said, what do you think about this? Uh, this kid going along with us, uh, you know, he's senior in high school age group. Um, you know, it's somebody's boyfriend that's going with us. And, and they said, well, it sounds like he needs a trip like this as much as anybody else in the group or maybe even more. And so we went to the panhandle of Florida, and we're working uh, for widows and widowers uh, in doing renovation and construction on their homes for people who were needy. Um, and so we had like three groups working all over town doing different things, different, uh, uh, di different types of work. And I would have to go at the end of each of those work days to collect the tools and to make sure they got the work done to the satisfaction of the person that we were working for and just to make sure that everything got wrapped up. And so I went to the last work site, the third one, and that... This kid was working at that site along with the elder, the guy that I was talking about. And as I drove up, I see somebody standing on top of a mobile home. And I'm like, 
Oh, Lord, please don't let that be one of our youth standing on top of that mobile home. There is no way. That's so dangerous. That's somebody's kid. We don't want anybody getting injured. And, and as I drove closer, I could see that it was that kid that, had, that, that was standing up there. And I was like, oh, no, Lord, what is going on here? And as I pulled up, I got out. And I'm like walking over to my friend who's an elder. And I said, hey, hey, what are we doing? We got to get him down off there. This is dangerous. We can't be doing this kind of stuff. These are people's children. And he goes, he put his hand up like that. And he said, He's cleaning gutters for all of these widows and widowers in this mobile home park and that don't have money to pay somebody uh, to get taken advantage to have their gutters cleaned. You know, even the mobile homes have a pitched roof so the water runs off. You wouldn't have a flat roof to get leaks. And so he was up there laying on his stomach and he was raking out that goop that was in the gutters of these people's houses. And he had this huge smile on his face. And I was like, what? What? how could a kid be smiling about having to do that? And this is at like 4 o'clock in the panhandle of Florida. It's 100 degrees. He's on top of the roof of a building, on top of this mobile home. And he was doing it for that little lady that was standing down below with her walker, and she was waving at him. And he was doing it for Jesus. And for once in his life, he was getting pats on the back, and people were saying, great job, well done, and... He was getting the affirmation from something positive rather than from how many drugs that he sold during the week. And for us, we've got to be reaching out as the church to try to reach a generation that is listening to folks for advice. They're seeking out folks with hats turned sideways or whatever it might be who are giving them very poor advice about how to live life. And so for us as the church, maybe we need to reshape, reform, reposition uh, how we're sharing the gospel and the ways that we're getting people to listen and obey the message of Jesus. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to stand in your pulpit and to gather as the body of Christ, as your church. And Lord, we are thankful that you give us uh, people in our lives. You bring people alongside of us to, to uh, listen to us and give us advice. People who love on us and, and share with us and invest in us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be that kind of person for someone else. That we would then be able to invest in someone's life and care about them and love them and, and take care of their needs, whatever it might be, so that they have the opportunity to hear and the chance to obey all of the wonderful things that Jesus has planned for their lives, Lord. We are thankful to you for that, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're an anchor for those who are hurting. We're a harbor for those who are lost. Sometimes it's not always easy bearing Calvary's cross. We've been ridiculed by those who don't know him and mocked by those who don't believe. Still I love standing up for my Jesus cause of all that he's done for me. That's why I am not ashamed of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, I am not afraid to be counted, but I'm willing to give my life. See, I'm ready to be all he wants me to be. To give up the wrong for the right No, I am not ashamed of the gospel No, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ For 
Every moment his hand has held mercy For all the love he's shown in my life A simple thanks doesn't say how I'm feeling Cause I get tears in my eyes So as for me so faithful to me cause I'm not out to please this whole world around me I've got my mind on eternity that's why I am not ashamed of the gospel the gospel of Jesus Christ Thank you so much. Man, that was, that was incredible. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord for that. Before we do the benediction, I've, I have to share with you, I've got so many friends that is, their families are being just broken because of somebody in their family, um, uh, whether it's addiction or whether it's crime or whether it is just uh, relationships or rebellion, whatever it might be. William and Catherine Booth were missionaries. They were actually, he was a minister, and they uh, lived in East London, the worst part of London, England, uh, in the kind of the 1840s, 1850s, in that time frame, I guess, maybe even a little later than that. And that particular part of town was the roughest part of town. Every other store was a bar, and uh, those bars would have high chairs so that the kids could get up to the bar to get a drink as well because this poor section of town, the kids didn't go to school. They actually went and worked a job all day, and they would come and drink with their parents at the bars. And William and Catherine would walk down the street singing hymns, and they were inviting people to church, and people would yell obscenities at them. They would throw trash and glass and bricks at them and tell them to shut up. And they were actually able to minister uh, to lots and lots of people, and especially to this one guy who was known as a brawler. He was an alcoholic, drunk, who would go into bars and fight for money, bare knuckle, and then would use all that money that he would win to get drunk, and he would go fall down, passed out in the streets uh, overnight. And they shared the gospel with him, and he came to know the Lord, and it transformed his life. They took him into their home, clothed and fed him, helped him to get clean from, from the alcohol to get through that. They did rehab in their own house. And they, 
they invested in his life, and he would speak in front of great, large groups of people and give his testimony about what God had done for him. And he would later become the head of the Salvation Army for all of England when William and Catherine went to other parts of the world to start the Salvation Army in other countries. And so I want to give you hope for those folks whose, whose lives right now are broken, who are experiencing such chaos in their lives because of a person uh, in their family or a friend that is really giving them a hard time. And no knowing that you need to be continue investing in their lives, trying to help them to listen and to obey the message that Jesus has sent. Um, make sure, do not be ashamed of the gospel. Let the love of Christ shine through you. Will you hear the benediction? Psalm 149, 1 through 5. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of His faithful people. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Let his faithful people rejoice in this honor and sing for joy on their beds. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.